Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the September 2023 meeting of Triangle Association of Freelancers. My name is Don Vaughn, and I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the five questions that you should, should always ask at almost every interview. Now, I've been working professionally for 46 years and working as a freelance writer full time since 1991. And during that time, I have interviewed probably hundreds, if not a couple thousand people on various topics. And I will tell you that the interview is my absolute favorite part of what I do for a living. I love talking to interesting people. I love pulling information from them. I love turning around and giving it to my readers. Everyone has a fascinating story to tell. And I always look forward to talking to people, especially those who have really unique jobs. Because I'm one of those people, I'm just preternaturally curious about everything. Wherever I go, whoever I meet, whatever I do, I always come away with so many questions on that. It's just, it's just part of my personality. So doing the interview is something that I really, really enjoy. And over the course of my career, I've realized that there are basically five questions that really can add heft and strength and nuance to the articles that we write. And this isn't just for nonfiction writers, too. I know that fiction writers often have to do research for their books, and sometimes it requires them to talk to subject matter experts. And the questions that I'm going to talk about now, that fits into that as well. It benefits fiction writers as well as nonfiction writers. So. The, excuse me. The first question is, what was your inspiration? And I'm going to read a little bit from an article that I did on this for Writer's Digest because I expressed it more eloquently in words than I can in talking to you. But the first question is, what was your inspiration? Now, inspiration is the creative spark that leads to great things. The aha moment when the abstract suddenly takes form. It strikes writers, musicians, researchers, and more anyone striving to create, build, or innovate. Almost every important accomplishment has started with a moment of inspiration, and it behooves writers to explore that aspect of a story. As a general freelancer, my work requires that I talk to people of all walks of life, from astronauts and artists to cancer researchers and filmmakers. Almost always, there is an important moment of inspiration in these people's stories, and I'm eager to explore it. For example, I recently interviewed renowned paleo artist William Stout for Back Issue magazine regarding his extensive dinosaur themed uh, comic book work. Now his covers are very action oriented and he did some covers for a series called Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. And there were two in particular that I was really intrigued about the inspiration for. And then, so I asked him and both of them stemmed from um, an excursion he took in the eighties um, he became a certified Arctic explorer, a diver, and he went to Antarctica to research the flora and fauna, which he was going to, to draw and paint. And um, in one, he went out in a Kodiak boat with one of his colleagues, and uh, she wanted to go out there coming home because in where they were, if you fall in the water, you're pretty much dead. Even if you're wearing a survival suit, you will not last long in this kind of water. So they're in the Kodiak. She wanted to go over here and take some photographs. And so he guided the boat over there and all of a sudden a wave came up and literally just put it on its end like this. And so um, he had to literally throw his entire body forward to the front of it to bring the boat down that way. And he basically saved their lives in doing that. Now, one of the other covers that he had done that I was intrigued about uh, showed some, uh, it was a King Kong cover and it showed some pterodactyls um, attacking some people. And from that same excursion, he was talking about there's these very aggressive birds in that region called skuas, S-K-U-A. And so you have to carry a stick with you because they will dive bomb you and they will attack you every time, but they only attack the highest point. So you bring a stick with you that's taller than you and the birds won't go beyond that. One of the researchers forgot his stick and a bird came in and slammed him into the back of his head, knocked the researcher to the ground, stunned the hell out of the skua. And it was just one of those crazy things. The poor researcher got up bleeding. It was a thing. But that particular story inspired that particular work of art. And if I hadn't asked that question, I would not have known that. And that kind of background really, really helped bring some color to the profile that I was writing. 
Now, the best way to approach this, what's your inspiration, is just to ask directly. You know, just say, what was your inspiration for this? What was your divine moment when you realized that this was something? And almost always their responses will be really something quotable. Inspiration is really powerful and it guides people and it pushes people that makes great things to happen. It's always worth exploring when you're doing an interview. The second question that we want to ask is, why is this important? Now, as the writer, we're interviewing subject matter experts. Perhaps we have a little bit of background on the topic itself. Um, and so we kind of, we may go into an interview understanding why something is important, or we believe we know why something is important. But it always behooves us to ask that question directly to someone, especially if it is an issue that, that helps people, like medical research or something like that. Now, you know, you might think, well, this is obvious, you know, this, it saves lives, that's why it's important. But sometimes something is important for a variety of other reasons. And it's very, could be important uh, in a different way to the, to the creator, to the subject matter expert, to the researcher or the artist, or whoever it is that you're talking to on something. Ask them, why is this important? Um, it may seem unnecessary, but it's a good idea to have your source explain that in their own words why they what they see is the importance of what you're talking about and what they're working on um and don't take for granted that you that you know the answer to that because they may give you something completely different that you really weren't expecting so it, it's a great question i love that one everybody faces challenges we writers face challenges when we're writing we've got deadlines you know sources we can't reach, every project, something worthwhile always has challenges. And so whenever I'm talking to someone, especially about their work, I say, what are the greatest challenges you face and how did you overcome them? Because everyone loves a triumph over adversity story. And that's exactly what these are. Now, what was the greatest challenges you faced? Um, um, when did you recognize them and how did you overcome them? This line of questions can reveal a source's intent the extent of their drive, and how they think through obstacles, which in turn helps illustrate the importance of their achievement. Challenges can take many forms, such as time constraints, a lack of uh, necessary materials or funding, or gaps in knowledge that need to be bridged. Challenges uh, become the primary, uh, challenges became the primary focus of a feature that I wrote for Veterinary Practice News about the San Diego Zoo's involvement in an international effort um, to save the, the almost extinct northern white rhinoceros in Africa. There were only two living examples of this breed in the world now, and both of them are females. There's a, a mother and a daughter. The, and the San Diego Zoo is deeply involved in this international effort to try and bring this species back from extinction. And so obviously the obstacles, the challenges in an effort like this um, are, are astronomical. They range from being a ovum pickup, which is a very, a very important skill known by very few people, being able to go in and take eggs, ovum, and to be able to fertilize them and grow particular cells. And so this, this question, you know, what were the biggest challenges and how do you overcome them? They reveal so much about the person that you're talking to, how their answers to this, and about the work that they're doing. You know, this was especially challenging. Why was this challenging? Um, and, and did you, at any point, did you feel, I can't, I can't overcome these challenges? Um, and then there was a eureka moment where you realized how you could. But again, this is information that we're not going to get from someone unless we ask them directly. So the challenge question can be vitally important and it can be so informative um, and can really add quite a bit to the articles that we're writing. Now, number four um, is what do you get personally from your work? And this is a question I think that more times than not, we fail to ask, but I think it's important. I mean, I love this, this question because it addresses the issues of motivation and reward. Why are you engaged in this effort and what joy do you derive from it? Unfortunately, we, we kind of gloss this over, you know, um, we don't really think about it, but it can, the result, it, it offers um, 
unanticipated directions and unanticipated information. And it also sheds great light on the personality of the person that we're talking to, you know, and, and some of the answers might be, you know, if you're talking to a researcher, what do you get out of it? Well, you know, my work saves lives and that gets me up every morning and that makes sense. But other people come out with a different answer, you know, it's like, what do you, you know, what do you get out of this personally? And it's like, well, I make a few bucks, but I'm giving promotion to a cause that's really important to me or something like that. Um, as an example, um, getting back to, to veterinary practice news. Um, last year, I think it was, I profiled a veterinarian in um, San Diego. His name is Quan Stewart, and he's known um, to a lot of people as the street vet. And his mission is providing free veterinary care to the pets of the unhoused. And he does this, he started in, in, uh, in Los Angeles and then got it started in San Diego. And he recently received funding that allows him to start up similar programs in a number of other cities. And so I asked Quan, you know, how did you, how did you get started in this? And he told me a story about how he used to go to the same 7-Eleven every morning to get a cup of coffee. And it was always the same homeless man out in front. And he had a dog. And he realized one day that this dog had such a severe flea problem that it looked like a burn victim. It was just, this animal was in agony. And so Quan introduced himself, said, I'm a veterinarian. Um, I see your dog has some problems. I'd be more than happy to come back and give you some medicine for free. And the guy's like little, you know, didn't know what to make of this, but he's like, okay. And so the next day, Quan came back with his medical bag and he treated the dog and, um, you know, gave the owner some other medicine that he could use to make sure the problem didn't come back. And he said um, a couple weeks later, he came back and the dog looked 100 mm percent. -hmm. But more importantly, were the tears in the homeless man's eyes at, at this miracle that Quan Stewart had worked for him simply as an act of charity, just you know, doing a kind thing for another human being. And that's when he realized that, that this was the aspect of veterinary medicine that meant the most to him now. He had been a regular you know, veterinarian and a practice and all, you know, all the regular stuff, which was all about making money and seeing patients and that's fine. But what he realized was it meant more to him. It gave him greater pleasure to provide services for those who desperately needed it but couldn't afford it. And so that was what he got out of his work personally. And when he told me that story, I knew I knew exactly what I was going to do with that information. I knew the quotes I was going to use. I knew exactly where it would be in the article. But I would not, again, I would not have had that, that, that just gem in my hand to use if I hadn't asked him that question. You know, I was like, what do you get out of this personally? So it's always a great question to ask. Now, before I go on to our fifth one, um, obviously these questions aren't going to be appropriate for every interview that we do. If I'm doing a service article on how to build a deck, I'm gonna interview a contractor and a carpenter and I'm not gonna ask them, you know, what do you get out of this personally and all this other stuff that wouldn't be appropriate. But if you're talking to people in an interesting job and more specifically, if this is for a profile, um, then these questions can play. Not all of them perhaps, but many of them can. And the fifth one, and this may seem like an obvious question, but we tend to forget it sometimes. And that is, I always like to conclude an interview by asking my sources, who else would you suggest that I talk to? Now, beginning writers, I think a lot of them, they have their questions, they stick to those questions, they don't deviate from those questions. They have their sources, it's like, these are the people I'm gonna talk to, don't need to talk to anybody else. But by asking this question, we can add, it, that attitude limits you. Um, but if we ask this question, who else, then we're going to get a broader, a deeper pool of expert sources. We're going to get additional views, additional perspectives, additional insight that we didn't have before. And so I always ask my, my sources, who else would you suggest? Now, sometimes the people that I suggest are people I've already talked to or people that I don't need to talk to or whatever. Not all of it pays out. But if someone says, well, you know, Dr. Jones over at, at Harvard is doing some really groundbreaking work. 
in this area. And not a lot has been written about that. You should talk to Dr. Jones. And so I was like, all right, I definitely need to talk to Dr. Jones. So, but the cool part is though, so when I contact Dr. Jones, I'm not really calling in cold because I've got this other guy in my pocket. And I can say, you know, I got this referral from Dr. Jones. Would you be willing to talk to me? He suggested I talk to you. And it's like, well, of course, if he recommended me, then I'd, I'd be more than happy to talk with you on this issue. Almost always that's how it plays out. I have never had a source decline after an invitation like that. So, you know, it's always worth asking. Um, and and the, 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 lastly, the beauty part of this is that this adds to our role of deck of, of sources that we can use down the road. You know what I mean? It's really, sources are not generally one-offs. Um, if I do a lot of writing for veterinary magazines. And so there's a, a lot of doctors that I rely on. You know, it's like if, if I'm doing something, I'm going to go to to um, NC State and talk to Dr. So-and-so over there, Dr. Olby or whoever it might be. And so you have a broad, a deep resource of sources that we have, you know, and, it was, and you keep these. And it's like, well, I talked to him this year. I'm doing this article on this, you know, next year. He would be a great source for that. So sources aren't discarded. Sources are collected and we keep them with us, you know, and it's like years might go by before you need to talk to a particular person. But by asking sources today who we should talk to, it adds to our list. It adds deeply to our, 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 our pool of resources that we can use moving forward. So those are the five questions. Um, they really work. Um, you really get some great insight. You get some great opinion. You get a greater depth of information. And I strongly, re I strongly suggest that you incorporate them into your interview questions. And on the issue of interviews, for those of you who, who are kind of new, I strongly, strongly encourage you to record all of your interviews, no matter how short, no matter how long. Record your interviews for very important reasons. Benefits you, it benefits your source. Um, and you might think, well, I'll just take notes. If you're taking notes and you're writing here and your source is already way over here, you're missing information. You're not going to be able to respond immediately when bombs are dropped in your lap. By recording, it allows you to actively listen rather than just hear. So that's why I'm a big, big fan of recording interviews. Person who is not is Gay Talese. He never records an interview. He absolutely refuses to. He takes notes on pieces of shirt cardboard that he keeps in his pockets. So that works for Gage to lease. I, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. So I'm a big fan of, of, uh, of recording our interviews. So that's what I have to say this evening. If anyone has any questions or anything. That's a great. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Joel. I think that was a terrific talk. Am I muted? Oh, thank you. And it looks like we have a question in the chat. Okay. Um, from Pamela. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Pamela, if you'll unmute, I'll take you directly. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering what recording method you use and how do you just transcribe it? Because I think that that's the hard part for me. Well, here's the thing. I'll tell you <laughs> something. For a, a very long time, a stupid long time, I used a analog tape recorder. Actually, I still have some down on the shelf at my feet. I used an analog tape recorder and I physically hand, tra hand transcribed all of my interviews until just a couple of years ago. So today, I, I, the first digital recorder I got was this little Sony thing right here. But today I use an Olympus digital voice recorder WS853. And this is what it looks like. And what I like about this is it comes with a built-in USB and that allows me to plug it in. So what I do is I record, what I do is um, I use my cell phone to record. I put my cell phone on speaker. I put my tape recorder next to my cell phone and I record the interview. And then when it's done, um, I plug the recorder into my computer, pardon me, and I download it. I had soup for dinner. Excuse me. And I download it as an MP3 file. And the platform I use for transcription is called otter.ai, O-T-T-E-R, like the little animal. And um, 
I found it to be, for my purposes, it works pretty well. It transcribes accurately about 80 to 85 percent. So you still really kind of go back and you got to do an edit on your transcript. But what it does, it, and it transcribes wicked fast. I mean, it can transcribe an hour's worth of conversation in less than 10 minutes. It's super quick um, and relatively accurate, but it has trouble with accents. It has trouble with fast speakers. Um, it, you know, there's certain things that it just, it just doesn't pick up. So I have to go in and do a quick edit on it. But the nice part about this is that um, after it transcribes, I can go in and import and I can just print off the transcript of the conversation and, and it is um, time noted throughout. So that way when I'm going through something and, and then while I'm uh, uh, editing it, I will play the MP3 um, in the background and follow it in the transcript. And then I stop and start as I make some minor corrections in that. So um, I'm paying about $100 a year for Otter, but it paid for itself almost immediately. Um, mm -hmm. as far as time saved, because I don't know about you guys, but transcription is just a brutal slog for me. <laughs> I hate it. It's the worst aspect of my job. So landing this. Now, I, I'm, this isn't an advertisement for Otter. There's a bunch of other ones out there, I understand. Otter's the one that I have experience with. Um, and as I said, it's worked relatively well for me. So that's what oh. I use. <clears throat> Pamela, you can also put um, Otter just as an app on your phone. Like I went to an interview today and just hit it and, you know, put my phone down and it recorded it. And then I send the transcript to myself as an email. So it's, okay. it's you know, super I, easy. I had a question. Sarah? I once had, I tried Otter once and it was kind of a fiasco because I did it straight from online instead of downloading the app for Otter. And so not, not everything recorded. Yeah, okay. um, is is otter is it only really usable if you if you go through the app to do the transcribing i go through the website i don't really? have an yeah. app app on my phone no i go directly through the website okay yeah, I, yeah. I usually do it with the phone but i had a phone interview and i was like what am i going to do because i tested it and it wouldn't if i talked on the phone to someone it wouldn't record it so I used it online and just put my phone by it and talked to the person and it did it for me. So it worked that way. Uh, Vera, do you have the subscription? Um, I do now because there is a free, a little bit of a free time that they give you, but you got to make sure you don't think your interview is going to go longer than that free time. Yeah. And I, I realized I needed to go ahead and get the subscription. Yeah, um, you can pay monthly or you can buy a year's worth. And I chose yeah. the year. I think it was a hundred dollars for twelve months. Yeah, um, it's a business true. expense for writers, so you can take exactly. it off your income tax. Exactly. Um, but it right saved now. my life. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Mm -hmm. so. well, well, I again, had a, a, a comment. I find that Microsoft Word translates transcribes live very well for me, and in fact, um, day before yesterday, my wife was in her office typing something. And I called from two rooms over to say, hey, honey, what do you want to pick up at the grocery store? And that showed up in her, her letter. <laughs> and I so that. I haven't had a problem with that. I want, what I want to try uh, experimenting with is recording something with my iPhone and then just putting it next to my computer yeah. microphone and turning it on and see how well it, it transcribes. Now, yeah. it's, not, it's not doing, you know, an hour in 10, in, in 10 minutes worth of work. But it does seem like that would be a, a usable, inexpensive way to do some transcription. Does anyone use any platforms other than Otter? Uh, uh, any other different kind of transcription service? Yes, uh, I use Whisper, Whisp the Whisper app. And On your I phone or? Uh, I do. I, I usually transcribe on our, I usually use Zoom to record because I do most of them from Zoom, but I also have an Olympus like you, so I can download it that way um, if I'm traveling um, and not doing Zoom, but it will do similar to what you're talking about, Don. It, it transcribes wicked fast okay. as well. Yeah. And it'll do different kinds of, uh, some of it's time, mm -hmm. some of it's not, it's not perfect but it's free. Yeah. 
that's always hopeful. It is. Yeah. Another thing I like about this tape recorder, though, and Nancy, if you have a similar one, you might agree, is that it has a really, really long recording capability. Yeah. Um, it has a deep memory. I th think if I understand it's, I want to say, God, over 10 hours, I think. Wow. It might be more than that, actually. Um, let me turn it on and see what it says. Um, but it's great. And the sound quality is also quite good. Um, 117 hours. So, yeah, that's a lot of a lot of interviews. And I've only it comes with four four folders. I've only used one ever. And I think I've got 45 interviews on this thing already. I need to go back and clear some stuff off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad about that. Does anyone have any other questions? Oh, is Hannah? A couple of questions. When do you ever take any notes in addition to having it recorded? I do. I back. take notes when I do an interview just mm -hmm. to help me kind of find information in the transcript. You know what I mean? Um, and just also I keep notes because I'll often think of additional questions um, that I want to ask the source in addition to the ones that I've got in front of me. And you should always mm -hmm. have all of your questions in front of you. Don't wing it. Don't say, I won't forget anything because sure as heck you will. So I write down every single question that I'm going to ask a source and I put them down by by topic or, or issue mm -hmm. so that I'm not forcing my source to talk about this and then go over here and talk about that. You know what I mean? They, it, it, yeah. it, it kind of disrupts their, their concentration, their train of thought. It makes it more difficult for people mm -hmm. to answer. So I structure my interview by topic and then, you know, by the time I'm at the end, everything's been talked about. When I was in college, I was doing a paper on women rabbis. And I used a legal pad for my questions. And I had a tape recorder. And I had something else to use as backup, just in case something failed. <laughs> and I also did some phone calls because I threw interviewing my, my rabbi she gave me the contact information for the very first woman rabbi who happened to live in New Jersey. So wow. I was pretty terrified when I talked to her, but she was <laughs> great. <laughs> and I learned actually from my father how to do it because um, he interviewed a lot of people from Brandeis guests and people that he wanted to come over and spend some time at Brandeis. So I, I learned great. from him. You know, you, you shouldn't be nervous. I mean, sometimes we interview some relatively famous people, you know, as, as freelance writers, but you should never be nervous to talk to somebody because, you know, whether they're an astronaut or an actor or an artist or whatever it might be, it's at the end of the day, it's two people doing their professional jobs. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And it's like, you know, they agree to talk to you. You're the journalist, they're the source, whatever it is. It's just two people chatting. It's nothing to get really worried about. It's nothing to get nervous about. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I've you know, I've talked to Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, and that was that was That's you know really fun. nerve wracking <laughs> a little bit, you know. Yeah, he goes sort of who he is, but mm -hmm. it, you know, immediately put to, both of us were at ease. It was just what are those things? <sighs> how you doing? Hey, how you doing? We're off to the races. I will tell you one quick thing about Neil deGrasse Tyson. He is completely incapable of giving you a succinct answer. I had 25 <laughs> questions for him. I had an hour of his time. I asked six. <laughs> I can believe it. I've yeah. seen him interviewed on different shows. Yeah, so, he yeah. he promises yeah. he will, but he yeah, but it can rein him in. It can't. Yeah. <laughs> Drew? So, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention how important it is to record uh, your sessions. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Many, many years ago, I interviewed Allen Ginsberg. And oh, again, I did it. It was um, when I when I did the recording it was analog because there wasn't digital at the time. I came back and I transcribed it. And then I wrote the article. This was actually for the uh, Denver Post. And um, I got a postcard from him, one from City Lights in, Cal in California in San Francisco saying, thank you so much for doing the interview. You're one of the few interview people that actually quoted me correctly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> so what the yeah. rabbis liked about my interview was they said that I asked questions that nobody else asked. I didn't, it wasn't the That's mundane important. usual stuff. Han, I'm glad you mentioned that because 
if, if you talk to somebody who's famous, they've done bazillion interviews and they've been yeah. asked the same freaking questions every single time. It, it's always a great, I mean, you, you got to get the basics, then think outside of the box, you know, at, come at them with some questions that they really weren't thinking about that's, that's pertinent to what you're talking about. You know what I mean? But look for different perspective on this. Um, a, a long time ago, I used to interview some adult film stars now and then for a magazine in Florida. And they were, we were expected to ask the kind of questions you would ask in an interview like that. And so I'd get that crap out of the way. And then we'd start talking about politics and we'd start talking about this. And I was throwing questions at these women that they had never been asked before. And they're like, you really want to know? And I'm like, yeah, let's talk about that. And so that led to some really interesting interviews. So think outside the box for the questions you're asking the person, especially if they've done, you know, interviews a bazillion times. And to um, prepare oh, for uh, that. Maya, and Maya first and then Julia. No, um, Hannah can go first. It's just a quick thing that to prepare for that, I listened to a lot of interviews and made notes of what the questions were. And then I knew what questions not to ask. <laughs> I, I will that. say on um, when we're, I, I've mentioned this before, but it, the, talking about the emotional component, mm -hmm. um, as I've said before, we generally will not talk about our emotions and our feelings unless we're directly asked. So mm -hmm. if the, the emotional state of your source is pertinent to the story, is pertinent to what you're talking about, don't hesitate to ask that question. You know, even if it's very specifically, what were you thinking? What was going through your mind in that moment? That kind of question can be so revealing, so revelatory, um, and can really show you sides of people that you hadn't imagined previously. So asking them that question is, is you know, is vital when it's appropriate. I'm not going to ask my carpenter that when I'm doing the article right. about how to build a deck, mm -hmm. but, you know, but sometimes it, it can really play into a story. Mm -hmm. Maya? Um, I was going to um, encouragingly push back about nerves um, because I've experienced being nervous oh. <laughs> during, not even an interview, it was a press conference. Mm -hmm. um, and it was almost kind of worst case scenario. So it's a press conference. I'm a brand new writer at a, at a newspaper. Um, and it's for sports. And I know almost nothing about sports. My connection, my only connection with sports is that I played in marching band. So we were at the football games. <laughs> and then on top of all this, it's about NASCAR. And I'm in Concord, North Carolina. And the star of the press conference is Magic Johnson. So I was way out of my league. I was so <laughs> out of my league, it wasn't even funny. And, and then, so of course, I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> And it showed, and I was just like, I was sitting there and he was doing um, this like diversity initiative um, for NASCAR. Cause um, uh, if, you've, if you've been to a NASCAR race, people tend to look different than I do. <laughs> Let's yeah, just forget about that. Um, and I'm water. Bubba. But um, so I was like, I'm, I'm just going to go for it. I have, and I was just thinking in my head, I was like, I have no business being here, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to stand up and I'm just going to go for it and ask him a question. Here's the thing. I was so nervous that to this day, gun to my head, I can't even tell you the question I asked. <laughs> um, so I stood up and I asked a question and I think it was something about, it was, it was on topic. And my voice cracked while I was asking the question. And shout out to Magic Johnson. Um, he totally pretended like that didn't happen. And <laughs> graciously, he was very nice and graciously answered my question. Oh, wow. And I just and I was just like, thank you. And I just kind of sat <laughs> back down. And um and I say all of that to say, and here's the thing, like um, some other people came up to me after the press conference and they were just like, that was a great question you asked. And, you know, I'm glad, you know, so it's okay to be nervous. And I would also say you could almost use your, what I learned from that is you can use your nerves to fuel your curiosity. 
-hmm. If you're yeah. nervous about talking to somebody, mm -hmm. there's usually at least a couple good reasons for that. Yeah. Because they're they're very accomplished in their in their field. And just think, well, it's like, and like Don said, I mean, yes, you know, we're all humans, you know, we're all we have our imperfections, but it's like use that to fuel your questions, you know, how how did they get to where they are now? Do they have any advice um, for people who want to get into that field? Um, and kind of using that to fuel your curiosity can help you with your nerves. That question about inspirations is oh so important. You yeah. Know? And because, you know, and that's why you'll notice I kind of ask that question whenever we do TAF talks or we have prominent writers as as meeting guests or whatever. I love having them talk about their inspirations because it informs so much. Um, and everybody's inspirations are different, you know what I mean? And and so it's like, I want to know when you were a kid, who who lit that fire, who lit that fuse, you know, mm -hmm. and then moving forward, who are your inspirations that kept you going and kept you going and kept you going? I think that's really, really important. Yeah. Um, and Maya, on your thing, Mark, tell super quick, Mark, tell very, very quickly your Bob Dole story. Unmute. <laughs> oh, there we go. Unmute. I'm back. Hey. Uh, well, I had uh, I had a uh, commission from Military Officer Magazine to uh, to write about um, erectile dysfunction, and um, I have no idea how I sold that. I didn't think that they were going to buy it, and it turned out that my editor Molly Wyman had gone to bat for me with the board who didn't want to do it <laughs> and all the guys she said all the guys in the uh, in the room are all kind of shaking their heads and all the women behind them are going <laughs> so um so uh so i thought well you know i can write about ed all day long but you know it'd be nice to get somebody who w is ex-military and at the time uh i think it was um uh, Viagra just came out, come out, and uh, Bob was the pitch man for Viagra, and so I contacted his uh, people, and uh, to my great surprise, they said okay. I think because it was military officer, okay. and uh, you know he's he's a military hero, bona fide. So um, I his assistant calls me one day and says. Um, I have the senator on the other line. Uh, is this a good time? And I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I'd been sitting there with my tape recorder just waiting. And um, he he comes on the line and he's very gruff. And he's sort of like, yeah, well, what can I do for you? And I, I said, uh, well, you know, I just wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the uh, commercials you've done and and all that kind of stuff. And I get the sense that he's not really, he doesn't want to do this at all. And so, and I never do this, but I kind of started buttering him up a little bit. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, it's, uh, I know you're running for president a while back and I'm sorry you didn't make it and blah, blah, blah. He starts warming up a little bit. And the more I kind of buttered him up, the more he was forthcoming. And by the end of the interview, it was like we were old pals. You know, <laughs> and uh, he kept saying, "Hey, it he sounds like you got a, a really young voice. How old are you?" And I think I was sixty. I was sixty at the time, I think. And he was, "Ah, you're just a kid. You're, you're just young." You know? uh, but it was kind of fun to talk to him, and um, and he really started joking around a lot. And so I started asking him a little about a little bit about his service as well because he was injured by a machine gun fire and I uh, had to lay there for an hour and a half, I believe it was, before the firefight was over and they could come and get him and take him to the hospital. And of course, that's why his arm was uh, didn't work right. Uh, but he really didn't want to talk about that. Uh, he he's, was very modest about his military service. and um, But fortunately for me, he was able to talk about erectile dysfunction. So... Uh, I got some great quotes out of it, and um, 
that's I think the last time I buttered somebody up. You got to be pretty <laughs> famous for me to butter you up. I'll tell but you right now. Yeah. yeah, but it worked. So you know you can't <laughs> argue with success, right? <laughs> Julia, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. Um, you you touched on this. Um, Maya, Hannah, she, uh, Elsa touched on this, but I, I got to ask you flat out. Uh, what was a question you absolutely regretted asking? Um. Oh, oh, I, I stupidly asked, uh, I challenged Ann Southern about her age. <laughs> I, who knows who Ann Southern is? Nobody knows who Ann Southern is. Ann Southern was really, really famous actress in the 40s, um, in 40s and 50s, and she had a very, very popular TV show. Um, on television back in the day. And she starred in a series of movies featuring a character called Maisie. It was Maisie in the circus and all this stuff. But she was really famous. She was a really, really big name in Hollywood back in the day. And I was interviewing her for Videoscope and I had learned that some somebody claimed her birth date was this and she was alleged, she said it was that. And like an idiot i i said something <laughs> about the the disparity on these holy mackerel did i regret that she was like 70 years old at the time and this was in the early 90s when we did this and man the, i'll tell you this is a fight you are not going to win <laughs> and i immediately immediately regretted it i immediately backpedaled it took about 10 minutes before we were back on an even keel and everything was hunky dory but i learned a valuable lesson super valuable lesson on that one that was the worst question i ever asked it really was um and i had i did a um i, I did an article about about um what was it penis enlargement surgery for for a penthouse form a long time ago and i entered there was a surgeon in florida who was doing this and i i interviewed a very prominent urologist at a very prominent university in chicago and he was vehemently opposed to this whole thing obviously and so uh, and but this doctor had turned it into a cottage industry so he kind of had it a pro and con thing and when the article came out, I sent him a copy of it. And the doctor was absolutely livid, livid that I had given words to the other side of this argument. And he said, if he had known that I was going to quote people who were in favor of this, he never would have talked to me. And it was like, he was, I was the angriest I've ever had a source be at me. And it was, wow. it was like, well, I mean, this was what the article was about. And I never, I never misled him or anything. I never said it was going to be just you. Um, yeah, I was always above board on this, but man, was that guy mad. I never forget. He did not him. understand how journalism works. Guess not. Right. No. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's it, Julia. Does anyone else have any questions or anything? Um, I have a comment, if I can. Yeah. Uh, you were taught otter is a wonderful thing, and I rely on it heavily. But just a warning, you know, my first question to people is, do you mind if I record this? Okay. Yeah. And yesterday I interviewed, I'm doing an article about some very, very small churches, like 10 pews, right? And how they're surviving in Wilmington, which is growing as much as Raleigh was 10, 15 years ago. So there's these little churches surrounded by all this development. But anyway, so I interviewed two elderly women that were members of one of these churches and I was all ready with my app and I said do you mind me uh, recording it oh no you can't record it so it's been so long since I did it by hand you know yeah so just always be prepared to have to do that it happens rarely I yeah. think it's happened maybe twice over the course of my career but your your experience shows you that you never know when it will yeah and how it, I address on phone Usually interviews older people that are a little suspicious of technology yeah. and what you're going to do with it young people don't care at all but the older generation some of them as you learn kind of have have uh, issues with this so on the phone when i'm doing this what i do is i you know you know we exchange pleasantries and i say i'd like to record our conversation for transcription and right. i don't give them an in or an out i just say hold on a moment while i <laughs> I oh, man, turn on my tape, put you on speaker and turn on my tape recorder. 
And yeah. then I just, I start the conversation. I've yeah. never had anybody freak out or anything since I've started doing that. No, um, she was, that she seems to kind of be a, a, a nice, easy way to kind of slide into it. Yeah, I, I told and her. I tell I them I'm just tell them you're doing it for I'll training. I'll tell them I'm recording. I'll tell them I'm recording so that I can transcribe. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's, that I seems to put them at ease because yeah, if they know it's put on the internet, or then it works to their benefit. Right. I said, I'm doing yeah, exactly. this because I want to quote you correctly. Yeah. And yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. The last time I, I physically hand wrote notes was when I was working at the Lake Worth Herald at the very <laughs> beginning of my career in the early 80s. Yeah. After that, once I got freelancing, I recorded yeah. everything. Uh, <laughs> but like you said, Vera, you never know when you're going to find the one who doesn't want it. The funny part is, you know, when I said I want to quote you correctly, she said, oh, honey, I'm not going to remember what I told you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. awesome. Fun interview. Does, so, does anyone have any good news to share? Anything got anything going on? Sue? Yeah, I'll put this in the, um, the Google groups. Um, I think you all, if you've known me for any amount of time, I was helping this black family down on the coast that was in the middle of a legal battle and the men stayed in jail for eight years for trespassing and they made a documentary about it. Oh, cool. Uh, Raul Peck, he's, I believe he's Haitian and he's done some documentaries and it will be on Amazon next month. But they're doing a premiere of it at NCCU next week, next Tuesday. Okay. So you you got, you know, um, how shall I put this? Audiences that are kind and receptive are more than welcome to come. Um, <laughs> but I'll give you a link. They really, really want to have an RSVP. They need a head count. So it's yeah. called Silver Dollar Road. Okay. And, what part of the coast? Uh, I'm sorry? What part of the coast? Uh, north, uh, it's right north of Beaufort. It's a town called Merriman. Okay. Okay. And, and supposedly I'm in it somewhere. So I haven't seen it yet. So <laughs> my mother, my 90 year old mother and I, uh, in the middle of winter, did a, a march. We're practically carrying my mom. <laughs> So if you see this sea of black person and then me and my mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's great news, Sue. Congrats. Yeah. And they're out of jail, by the way. They finally did get out of jail. Oh, good. Yeah. And it went to the North Carolina Supreme Court. So yeah. All right. Any, any more? Got, uh, um, an article coming out in the October uh, Walter magazine. Oh, on what? Uh, well, oddly enough, on the state fair, and it's more pitch, not, you know, there's some pitch about what it's the exciting things to do, but I was really more concerned with the sort of thing that the newspaper or that the uh, TV stations are not going to emphasize, which is the background of, the, of, of it. Yeah. You know, originally, it was 16 acres east of Raleigh, and then after the Civil War, it was set up where the Rose Garden, where the little theater is, that was the racetrack, oh. which is why the race, the Rose Garden is so oddly shaped. And um, the um, the woman who who was married to the fellow that built um, the Vanderbilts, who built Biltmore, she was head of the State Fair Committee for years and years. She mm -hmm. also was head of the North Carolina Automobile Association and uh, managed for the first time to get parking at the state fair. Uh, the other thing I found that was very interesting and I'm, I'm looking into for a separate article is that there was a, a, a what they call the colored state fair and that started in North Carolina and that became so popular throughout the South and other racist states that there was an entire professional organization called the, the Colored Fair Managers Association. But it was a very, it was, a, it was an era when African Americans could not exhibit at the state fair. They could come and attend, but they weren't allowed to exhibit you know, what they did, how well they did preserves or raised cattle or you know whatever. 
And so this particular uh, institution grew up and it wasn't until 1965, the state fair integrated itself in terms of exhibitions. Wow. And, you know, and, and in that, it was only that black and white 4-H groups could work together. So, you know, I was looking at, at um, sort of the background of it, and I thought that was a, I thought that was a lot more interesting than talking about uh, fried dough again. <laughs> How many articles have you sold to Walter Joel? I guess eight or nine, because oh. I'm doing, an, I'm doing another one on line dancing for him, um, <laughs> which, which got delayed because I had, I had torn meniscus that had to be <laughs> operated on. <laughs> And I just don't dance all that well when you know my knee has been uh, operated on. But yeah, that's a good number of articles, though, man. Congrats on that. Well, thank you. Uh, in fact, this is the this is the their main their main lead article. They sent me a mock up of it, and I'm just incredibly impressed with how they made it look. Oh, that's terrific. And I'm and I'm and of course the main thing is I'm always happy when the check doesn't bounce, <laughs> and they never do with Walter. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have some good news? Anybody? Hannah? Well, good news that the Fine Lines Anthology, uh, Dave Martin, has asked me to present at their next writing conference, which is the weekend of um, October 7th and 8th. So their theme is hope. And last conference, I shared a story about how my father-in-law survived in Auschwitz because Victor Frankl took him under his wing and wow. taught him how to stay alive. Wow. wow. So from that, right. I mean, yeah be bringing that as my main focus for my piece that I present. For That's great, Hannah. Congrats. Thank you. That's terrific. Anybody else? Uh, Nancy? Me? Yep. Um, I just want to mention, I just got deposited my check from Writer's Digest for write, reading and reviewing a mess of books. <laughs> and now I'm doing, huh? now I'm doing their ebook. But if anybody is interested in some extra money on the side, it's very time consuming. But since I had my broken body, it was easy for me. I couldn't write, so I might as well keep reading. Yeah, so Anne's I kept in the asking of her, for more books. books too. Yeah, yeah I did that as well. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm doing I, the ebook one, so now I can just open this. Yeah, I, uh, anywhere. I, the it's reviewing really like is the easy. The reviewing is a bitch. Um, I yeah. I did a hundred books, which was oh way more than I could have handled. Um, but there were two picture books, y'all. I shouldn't even tell you this. And one of these picture books, these are little kids, and the mother eats the kids. Oh, gosh. oh God! <laughs> oh, it's just a nightmare. It's just a nightmare. Just I didn't have social services right over at that house. Oh, really? and I notified oh, them. Goodness. And then another one, it was this beautiful book, beautifully illustrated. And it talks about how different religions deal with death. And then at the end, she goes, Well, maybe it's just like Peter Pan says, where death is just the next great adventure. And then <laughs> and then Peter Pan was like World War One, like the guys going off and you know, it's like sort of pep talk or whatever. can you imagine handing that to a kid a picture book i put it all over it suicide warning suicide <laughs> really <laughs> oh, god well, so were you able to things. say in these um reviews what you really meant i mean what you really thought i'm sorry can you say that again yeah you, you jennifer was wondering if you could really express yourselves in the in the review of the book but they, first of all what those two books, do is offer some what's good about it and then yeah. some suggestions on how they can make it better. Well, yeah. uh, with those two books, I notified the organizers. I said, you should just pull these right now. The, yeah. I mean, this is really dangerous. You know, warning, warning, you know, age inappropriate. And they said, no, just put it in the review. So I put it in caps in the review. That's a Burn this idea. book! <laughs> yeah, Nan's yeah, read some really weird, troubling <laughs> stuff also. Yeah, um, I can't, it, it's just... But, Don, when I had COVID... I, I answered too honestly for some, and one of my comments was, you know, less television watching, more reading. And that came back to me. I had like four come back because I didn't feel good and I was cranky. I didn't refuse. And I don't usually get anything back. Well, I submitted the review. Uh, 
<laughs> I do want to say though that there were a couple of really astounding books. Yeah, I do want to say that. man got some too. Julia, uh, I was just going to say um, my part-time job. Uh, one of them I've been working as a cashier, and I came up with an idea for goblins living in a grocery store because I have kids trying to climb on and play with or even lick the conveyor belts. God. And so I, I had I, <laughs> something burst out of my mouth. Don't do that. If you lick the conveyor belt, you smell like goblin feet. You <laughs> goblin feet. Yes. Yeah. You need to write that story. Yeah, you do. For okay. Sure. I shall. Yes. I love it. <laughs> yes, All right. Yes. I've got a folks. I've got something at a, at eight twenty. So I need to to be off by then. So I'm gonna end the good news part of this by telling you that this week I achieved freelance nirvana. I delivered, I wrote and delivered the Encyclopedia Britannica entry on the Flintstones. Oh, oh, that one. Yeah, that was my that idea. Is. I pitched it. Um, I'm also happy to report I just got seven more assignments from Britannica, which I'm very excited about. And okay. I just got my fourth assignment from the Saturday Evening Post. Um, wow. This is just for the website, so it doesn't, it pays next to nothing. But I like to have that credit on my resume, and it's something right. that I can write super duper quick. So I went ahead and I said yes to that. But yeah, so I'm um, excited. excited about oh, that. So great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thank you all this evening. I hope that you guys had a good time. I hope you got yeah. a little bit out of my my presentation on the five questions. Um, let me remind new members to, you know, take advantage of the listserv. If you've got questions, we've got answers. And also a final, well, not a final, but a reminder that our TAP talk with Nathaniel Philbrick is on Monday or whatever October 9th is. Monday, um, October 9th. Monday, October 9th. Um, I'm super excited about this. So I really hope all of you will, will join us for that one. And that's going to be a lot of fun. He's a super cool guy. Very I good. definitely recommend his book, In the Heart of the Sea, which was made into a movie with Chris Hemsworth, directed by Ron Howard. Uh, book is great. Movie's really good. I think you'll enjoy it. So anyway, I hope you all have a great evening. And I will see you next month. Okay. Take care. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Bye.